Think of a time where you felt you really belonged somewhere. Somewhere where you had everything you needed and you felt truly accepted. For me, growing up, I didn't always feel like I belonged with my family. But there was one moment every week where I really did. And that was when we were sitting around the dinner table, eating together, feeling nourished by both the mealtime conversation and my mum's delicious food. Now I'd like you to think of a time where you felt that you didn't belong somewhere. Somewhere where you felt excluded because you were different. For me, growing up, this was age 11, when I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. I remember a nurse came into my school to explain to all the other kids about my new health condition. And as she explained to everyone that every time I ate something, I would have to take an insulin injection, and sometimes I might act weirdly because I had high blood sugars, and that sometimes I would go unconscious, I remember feeling a lot of shame. I came home to my mum and I said, I wish I could be like everyone else. I just hate being different. Age 21, I moved to Mexico to study. And I met a young boy called Pepe. He was age 11 and had just been diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, like me. The difference was that his parents could only afford a quarter of his daily insulin requirements. And he was very ill. He knew that he didn't have long to live without insulin. I met his father, Juan, and Juan said, don't worry, Jess, I've got a plan. I'm going to take this incredibly dangerous cargo train up to the US border and cross over into the US, find illegal work, and send money back to pay for Pepe's insulin. When he told me this, I felt tears rolling down my cheek. I thought of my own father taking this journey to save my life. And I also felt guilty that just because I was born in a country with a free health service, I didn't have to worry about my survival. Juan and Pepe taught me that survival for some people means leaving the place where you feel belonging. From the beginning of time, humans have escaped war, persecution, climate change. And they've migrated to find somewhere which better meets their needs. In fact, every single person here today is here thanks to migration. Our ancestors migrated from Africa. After uni, I moved to Spanish Morocco to work with refugees. I remember the day that I was asked to attend the funeral service of an unidentified person who had died at sea trying to get to Europe. As I sat there in the service, I remember my eyes welling up. I felt so sad that someone had to take this level of risk in search of a better life. It was time for me to come back to the UK, but I knew I wanted to continue helping people that had been forced to leave their countries. I just wasn't sure how yet. I arrived back to the UK just in time for the Brexit referendum. I remember I woke up the morning of the referendum results and I was completely shocked to learn that the British people had voted to leave the European Union. I turned on the television and all I could hear was people saying, I'm not happy with migration, that's why I voted to leave. I couldn't understand why the British people were so unhappy about migration until I met Mabel. I was working in West London in a council estate where I was asked to knock on the doors of 500 residents and invite them to the local community centre, which had been out of use for the last 10 years. I knocked on Mabel's door. She was a white, elderly British woman who'd lived her whole life on the estate. Mabel said to me, I'm not coming anywhere near that community centre because the migrants will be there, and I don't like the migrants. I was very taken aback by this response. I asked Mabel why she didn't like the migrants. She told me, it's more like the migrants don't like me. I've tried speaking to them, but they don't speak English, and I've given up. 
I see them all dressed up, going to their parties. I think it's Eid they're going to, and they never, ever invite me. She said she was upset that her daughter tried to get a flat on the estate and was told there was no room. She told me, the reason there's no room is because the migrants are taking all of our houses. Mabel went on for a long time, and she kept repeating, no one looks like me on this estate anymore. I don't feel like I belong here. I wasn't sure how to respond. I couldn't stop thinking about this conversation. Mabel had experienced a lot of change. I knew that 30 years ago, it was a 95% white British population on her estate. And today, it was now down to a 40% white British population. It comes back to this question I started with today. What does it mean to feel that we belong somewhere? In the same way that I didn't like growing up feeling different, Mabel didn't like feeling different on her estate. You may have heard this phrase, birds of a feather flock together. What this refers to is our human tendency to stick to our own kind. What we're seeing today is a diverse country, but a very divided country, because people who are different aren't mixing. You see, every day, Mabel was reading headlines like this. Mabel had lived her whole life on that council estate, living in poverty. What she was sharing with me was she felt she didn't have enough resources for herself, and so she saw migrants to be a threat to those resources. But I knew that this headline was completely untrue. Between 2001 and 2011, migrants had made a net contribution in tax of 25 billion pounds. This was money going to our schools, our NHS, our social housing. I was sure that if Mabel got to know a migrant on her estate and had a positive experience, she would base her interaction, she would base her views on that interaction rather than on what she'd read in the newspaper. So once more, I went back to Mabel's house. This time, I asked Mabel what her favorite food was. Mabel told me CTM. Does anyone know what CTM is? It's the British national dish. Chicken tikka masala, yeah. Yeah, Mabel said that there was a takeaway on her estate that she went to every Friday night, and she absolutely loved it. I thought this was pretty amusing, because while she was very unhappy about the influence of migration on her estate, she was really happy about the influence of migration in her food. And this gave me an idea. At the same time, I was teaching English to a group of people from refugee and migrant backgrounds. They were all unemployed despite really wanting to work, and this was often because of language barriers and their qualifications not being recognized in this country. On one particular session, I asked every single person in the room to tell me what skill they would like to share with their community. As we went round the room, each person said, I would love to teach my community to cook. That's something that I feel really confident about. In the room that day were people from Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Ethiopia, Congo, Cuba, Iraq, Iran, Syria, so many exciting cuisines. And I thought, I'm sure there's lots of people in this country that would love to learn how to cook your food, and we could make this your job. So I tried out the idea by inviting an Iranian woman called Alahe round to my house to teach my friends. At first, she was horrified by the lack of kitchen utensils in my kitchen. But after a while, she started to really enjoy herself. Afterwards, she said to me, Jess, teaching that Iranian cookery class was the first time I really felt I belonged in this country since I arrived seven years ago. My friends said to me that Alahe's food was the best food they'd ever tried, and they really loved meeting her. The idea seemed to work. Once more, went back to Mabel's house. This time, I invited her to an Indian cookery class in the community center taught by a local Indian resident. 
She told me, Jess, I've told you before, I'm not coming anywhere near the community centre. I almost gave up. But then I said, Mabel, you, you told me that you like curry and you could learn to cook your own curry. Mabel said, no, I don't like cooking and I'm not coming. So I left. But on the day of the cookery class, Mabel showed up. She sat very quietly in the corner of the room. And at the end, she came up to me and whispered quietly in my ear, Jess, the, the curry's not as good as the curry from my takeaway. <laughs> but I'm glad that I came, and thanks for inviting me. And I felt this was progress. This led me to found the organisation My Grateful, where refugees and asylum seekers from all over the world teach their traditional cuisines to the public. I called it My Grateful because I hoped that the cookery classes would inspire the British people to feel grateful for what migration offered our country. Since starting My Grateful five years ago, we have run 3,000 cookery classes with 30,000 participants. And we have 60 chefs from all over the world teaching their cuisines. I discovered that there was a theory behind why the cookery classes could change Mabel's negative perceptions of migration. It was called contact theory. This is the idea that when two opposing groups come together in a setting where there is equal status and a shared goal, this reduces prejudice. Contact theory worked so well in the cookery classes because the migrant chef is the teacher leading everyone in a shared goal to cook a meal together and then sit down to enjoy the meal. What was happening is that through that contact, anxiety about the other group was reduced and empathy is formed. The result is that it's hard to be unkind to someone who's similar to you. I overheard participants saying things like, wow, refugees are so normal, I never knew. And I guess the idea was working. Jamie liked the idea, Megan liked the idea, the Forbes 30 Under 30 panel liked the idea. And most importantly, our chefs seem to be really benefiting. This is Ahmed. Ahmed had to wait six years until he got his refugee status in the UK. That whole time, he wasn't allowed to legally work. He said to me, this just feels so hostile. And in fact, that was the name of the policy introduced in 2012. The hostile environment policy was purposely designed to make the UK so hostile to migrants that they would voluntarily leave. Imagine what it would be like not to be able to work for one year. Some of the migrateful chefs have been waiting 15 years, 20 years, and that whole time they're not allowed to legally work and they're not eligible for benefits. So the only way they can survive is through charity. They say to me, Jess, we don't want charity, we just want to be able to provide for ourselves and feel that we belong here. Now, the UK government say that they need these harsh policies to migrants because this is what the British people want. And yet we've seen a different response to Ukrainian refugees. The UK government website broke when it was flooded with over 100,000 people offering up their homes to host Ukrainian refugees. Now, my grateful chefs have said to me, Jess, why is it that the British people are happy for the Ukrainian refugees to come here? but they're not happy for me to come here. What's the difference? 
And this is a really hard question for me to answer. It could be that the British media has given us so much contact to the tragedy of the Ukrainian refugee experience that our empathy has developed and we want to do something. My question is, can we extend this empathy to all refugees? The reason that the hostile environment policy hasn't worked is because the reason that people have to come to the UK seeking safety remains. At the same time, we're seeing the government announce that they'll be sending asylum seekers to Rwanda if they arrive here illegally. And yet there basically are no legal routes to the UK. Last year, there was 82 million refugees in the world. Can you guess how many the UK was hosting? 136,000. In comparison, Germany was hosting 1.2 million refugees. And yes, Germany is a bit bigger, but it's not 10 times bigger. I think the UK could be doing a lot more. The contact that I had with people forced to leave their countries in my early 20s inspired me to start my Grateful. I was sure that if the British people met the My Grateful Chefs in the context of the cookery classes, they would also develop this empathy and no longer want these harsh policies to migrants. Instead of seeing migrants coming to this country as a crisis, they would start to see it as something to be grateful for. What could you do in your community to help people to have contact? could be as simple as sharing a meal. I want you to think back to that time where you felt you really belonged somewhere. For me, it was around the dinner table with my family. This isn't a migrant crisis. It's a crisis of belonging. And one that I think we could solve through sharing food. Because food reminds us that we're all human, wanting the same thing, to feel that we belong. I want to live in a country where everyone can feel they belong, including Ahmed and Mabel. Thank you.